I dedicate this story to all who don't believe in the supernatural. Trust me, there's definitely something out there, and it's better left unseen. Hello, my name is Joe Treves. I've spent over 20 years serving as a police officer. I've experienced a great deal in my career, detaining dangerous criminals, searching for the missing, and investigating complex cases that spanned years. I've seen tragic endings that I still struggle to get used to. But there's one case from my career that still sends shivers down my spine. It was probably my second year on the force. Back then, I was renting a modest apartment in the north of the state and keeping peace in a dreary little town. My partner and I would lazily cruise through the empty streets, occasionally dispersing drunken locals from the pubs. Oh, how I detested that crowd more than any other. Hard-working men, laboring day and night to support their families, would transform into wild boars by night. Their shouts could be heard across the neighborhood, drunk men squabbling over petty issues and always on the brink of a fight to defend their senseless pride. Mostly, we ended it with a warning. Our siren could be heard from afar. The owners of cheap bars would try to calm their patrons, eager to make as much money as possible. But sometimes, we had to drag the barely mobile body of another drunk to the station. The small room would instantly fill with the smell of alcohol, turning into a free hotel room for the detained. Within an hour, we'd be enjoying the sound of his snoring. Come morning, we'd issue a fine and send our guest on his way, knowing well he'd be back in a few days. I was biding my time and marking days off my calendar, readying for my transfer to the central office. Life in a big metropolis seemed much more appealing. I was already imagining myself handling the most challenging cases, rescuing the vulnerable, and bringing joy to those who had long searched for their relatives. But as it turned out, reality was far scarier than any bright fantasy. That evening, Dick left the shift early. His wife was in her final months of pregnancy and feeling unwell. Well, we often ended up alone on duty. It went against the rules, but let's be honest, there were more dull moments than acts of heroism. Around two in the morning, the phone rang sharply. Damn, this shift won't be quiet, I thought, and I was right. A wild scream and some rustling were heard on the line before a frantic male voice said, Police, help, can you hear me? It's a complete mess and someone seems to be robbing Aunt Sima's store. I took down the details, already knowing where I would have to go. The forgotten district was on the outskirts of the town, next to the highway. A small store there was run by Seema Hale, who had lived in these parts since birth. The private wooden house housed a grocery section with a couple of living rooms at the back. I didn't know all the details, but it was a true family business. The store used to be profitable, now barely staying afloat thanks to truck drivers and the occasional tourist. Honestly, I didn't like Seima. It seemed the old lady had lost her mind long ago. She never engaged in conversation with customers, answered only when necessary, and never smiled. But what scared me the most was her gaze. Do you know what empty eyes look like? Believe me, it's terrifying. No emotion at all. It feels like they're looking right into your soul. Her brother Steve, on the other hand, was always friendly, cheerful, and ready to help with anything. I lazily started the car and pulled away. I could have called Dick, but I was confident I could disperse the local thieves myself and return to the station in a few hours. Little did I know, my life would never be the same. As I approached the store, I realized things were far more serious than I had anticipated. The yard was in complete disarray, as if someone had tried to defend themselves. I readied my gun, and just to be safe, I gave my coordinates to the dispatcher. There was a phone booth at the entrance, its receiver swinging in the wind, creaking unpleasantly. I hung it back up and swallowed nervously. Perhaps this was where the call to the station had been made. But where was the witness? Where had he rushed off to? A chilling premonition pierced through me. I stood at the glass doors, unable to make myself step inside until I heard a strange ringing. I quickly entered the main hall and leaned against the wall. It seemed empty except for me. 
All I needed was to find the owners and understand what had happened. Suddenly, something moved towards me from the depths of the grocery shelves. I spun around and was nearly speechless. A child's soccer ball rolled towards me across the floor. Then I heard the sound of little bare feet pattering, and it was getting closer. Frozen, I stood with my gun in hand, unsure what to do. The ball stopped a couple of meters from me, then rolled back just as quickly, as if someone had caught up to it and kicked it. I slowly followed the ball, not knowing what to do next. Groceries were strewn all around. Do you see it too? I heard a strained voice and nearly went numb with fear. Saima was standing by the cash register, her face as pale as paper, her hair disheveled. Do you see it? She repeated her question. Mrs. Hale, calm down and try to explain what happened. Is there anyone else here? I tried to stay calm, but something about this scene was deeply unsettling. She replied that Steve had gone for help and then broke down in tears. At that moment, the lights throughout the place went out. I swear, I felt something, but I could never explain it. It seemed like time had stopped. I couldn't hear my footsteps or my heartbeat. I watched Sema silently open her mouth, thinking I had gone mad. Then something cold touched my hand. I looked down, but saw nothing but my boots. Suddenly, I was overwhelmed with such a profound sense of despair that I wanted to burst into wild tears. I don't know how much time passed. I had lost all sense of reality until Steve approached me, shining a flashlight in my face. Sounds returned, and I could finally think clearly. I immediately grabbed the radio and called for backup. I knew I couldn't handle this alone. Handle what? I didn't know but I was very scared. A few minutes later, officers from the neighboring district arrived. They surveyed the area, made routine notes, and cursed about Dick's absence. I managed to resolve that issue, although I swore never to patrol at night without a partner again. All the while, Steve comforted Saima and looked at me sympathetically. Later, he told me that such incidents happened every six months. Years ago, a tragic fire occurred one night at a camp by the nearby Forest Lake. Since then, strange things had started happening in the area. He was used to this kind of poltergeist activity, but Saima was deeply troubled by the invisible visitor's nightly visits. Steve wanted to share more eerie stories about the place, but I asked him to stop. What I had witnessed that night was enough for me. He apologized for the call. It turned out that a local had seen someone tossing around the goods and had run for help. Well, his actions were justified. All the way home, I drove in silence, replaying every minute spent in that grim store. And you know, I felt so melancholy and pained. Who were they? Those who came to play with toys at night. Fortunately, I received my transfer to the city a few weeks later. My career has had its fair share of oddities. Maybe later I'll share a couple more interesting stories here. But this incident was the wildest and most unsettling. Such things are unforgettable. Second story. I want to share the scariest thing I've ever witnessed. The sight of my always smiling father, a streak of gray through his hair, with an expression of absolute terror on his face. Dad is long gone, but this story will stay with me forever. My name is Taddy. My father, who loved elfish tales as a child, chose this name for me. My mother opposed his job in the police force. Our town was going through tough times. Local thieves roamed the streets, and waking up to the sound of gunfire had become routine for us. But Dad always joked that he was a real hero, like Batman, who would save the universe. It seems we had gotten used to the constant danger and the fear for his life. Sweetie, Derek's in the hospital again. Don't worry, it's just a minor leg injury, I would often hear my mother say instead of good morning. But one day, Dad saw something terrifying, something that made him rethink his life and quit the career he loved so much. I remember that evening well. Dark clouds had been gathering since dusk. Mom paced the house, closing the windows. 
We were preparing for a storm which I always hated. Nature seemed to pause. I stared into the dark expanse of the rye fields, shivering with fear. Dad, as usual, was on shift and wasn't due back until morning. That night, Mom let me sleep with her. The thunder was maddening. The rain hammered on the windows, threatening to break them. We told each other funny life stories, and I finally fell asleep. In the morning, bright sunlight filled the room, erasing any trace of the stormy night. Mom was no longer in the bedroom, but I immediately heard her anxious voice from the kitchen. I don't know what came over me, but I slowly walked to the door and began to eavesdrop on my parents' conversation. What I heard terrified me. Honey, you can't imagine what we went through. That woman, she looked like a ghost. Neighbors called us to the suburbs, alarmed. They saw the lady of the house in her yard with a canister of gasoline. She was clearly behaving strangely and planning to do something dreadful. I was working with Tyler that shift. He drove as if he was blindfolded. The rain poured down the windshield and we navigated by the flashes of lightning, nearly running off the road twice. A crowd had gathered at her house. People soaked to the bone seemed unwilling to disperse. People always crave bread and circuses and forget about their safety. Tyler immediately ordered them to go home. We carefully entered the yard and looked around. The door to the house was open and we saw a faint candlelight from a second floor window. I led the way. The living room was in total disarray and everything was stained with something suspiciously red. I felt that we needed backup. Mary, something seemed to draw us into that house. I hadn't felt such fear in a long time. Not for myself, but for someone in the house. It seemed urgent that help was needed. This woman. She suddenly darted out from around the corner and stopped abruptly when she saw us. I gestured for Tyler to hold back. We froze in pitch darkness, and only thanks to the bright beam of the flashlight could we navigate. Ma'am, do you need help? I asked tentatively, reaching out my hand. Mary! In that instant, she was right in front of my face, sniffing the air like a dog. You know, she seemed to sniff me, then opened her mouth and let out such a piercing scream, I thought my eardrums would burst. Her face... Lord, it didn't seem human. And at that moment, Tyler couldn't take it. He surged forward, and she dashed to the end of the corridor and ran up to the roof. My partner seemed not to hear me. He ran ahead, begging her to stop. I rushed outside, got to the car, called for an ambulance and the fire department. It was as if I already knew what was next. Just imagine. She stood on the very edge of the roof in some absurd, colorful dress just a step away from tragedy. The wind whipped her hair around, and it was such a ghastly sight. I yelled into the radio to Tyler, telling him not to make any sudden moves, but the connection seemed to cut off. The woman was screaming and drawing wild symbols in the air. At that moment, I saw a bright flash from the basement. The fire started so quickly, it seemed as if some unknown force was controlling it. Fortunately, within a few minutes, the sound of sirens echoed. Mary, we were just lucky that the fire crews were nearby. I stood rooted to the spot, trying to distract her, but she clearly wasn't concerned with me. At one point our eyes met, and I felt such a profound sorrow as if she shared it with me. An hour later, it was all over. The fire was extinguished, and the woman was brought down and taken to the ambulance. She walked obediently with the doctors, as if she had been waiting just for them. And in her eyes, I saw relief. I don't know what happened in her life, but it was certainly something terrible. Tyler wasn't hurt, but he only said one phrase. Derek. That fire ignited by itself. She was already up on the roof when flames appeared right in front of my face. That's just not possible. I couldn't bear to hear anymore. I rushed to my father and hugged him tightly. He awkwardly patted my head and tried to smile. That's when I noticed his hair. My dad had left for work a fiery brunette, but he returned with a profound streak of gray. 
and his eyes. They were filled with so much worry. I don't know the continuation of this story, and I hope that the lady is all right. A few days later, my father told us that he was leaving the service and had already found a job at a law firm near home. Mom was happy, and I felt grateful to fate that he was alive and near. We lived a wonderful life, moved to a quiet area, and bought the house of our dreams. There are far more unfortunate people than dangerous ones, my father always said, and I agree with him. Third story, the eerie voice on the phone had chilled me to the core. As a cop, facing a potential stalker should have been just another day at work, but this was different. Here's how it all started. A year after I had moved to southern Wisconsin, I landed a job at a small police station. I was still green, mostly running errands and handling paperwork. It was the typical start for anyone in law enforcement, waiting for a chance to prove my worth. Little did I know, it would come at a great cost. The first call came on a night I was off duty, relaxing at home after sending my friend Dorothy, who worked at a local pool hall, off in a taxi. I was settling down with a beer when the ringing of my home phone shattered the quiet of the night. I walked to the living room and picked up the receiver. Charlie, are you bored? Do you like playing hide and seek? A raspy male voice asked. I was taken aback and, annoyed, I vented my frustration and hung up. It was only hours later, as I lay on the couch, that a troubling thought struck me. How did he know my name? Yes, I could have traced the call to find out where it came from, but at that moment, I convinced myself it was just a stupid prank. Days passed and I almost forgot about the call. Then, one day after lunch, I returned to my desk to find a note next to my keyboard in bright font. Do you like hide and seek, Charlie? Can you find me? This was no longer funny. Initially, I thought it was a prank by my colleagues, treating me still like a rookie. Frustrated, I took the note to Burton, the oldest and most skilled surveillance expert at our station. He was the only one who had welcomed me warmly, teaching me the ropes. I briefly explained the situation to him. He smiled, tapped something on his screen, and soon footage of the office appeared. We scrutinized the video, looking for anyone who might have approached my desk, but there was nothing. It was just another day, with no one near my desk. Maybe you brought it with you, kid, or someone slipped it into your jacket and it fell out, Burton suggested kindly, patting my shoulder. I nodded, somewhat embarrassed, and returned to my desk, thankful at least that Burton hadn't dismissed me outright. Still, a nagging sense of unease grew stronger each day. I had no enemies and got along well with everyone at work. I wasn't the type to step on anyone's toes or meddle in affairs not my own. That weekend, I invited Dorothy and a couple of colleagues, Mason and Stan, over for a get-together. Stan, always full of workplace tales and career anecdotes, entertained us, while Mason seemed a bit uneasy when I shared the strange calls and the note. Stan brushed it off as likely a prank. After a long night, Dorothy headed back to work, and I, exhausted, went to bed. Lying there, I pondered Dorothy's lifestyle, admiring how she balanced relaxation with her nighttime job. I liked her, but I knew nothing serious could come from it. But my thoughts soon shifted back to the mysterious stalker. Why me? What did they want? The question swirled in my head as I drifted off to sleep, unaware of the events that were about to unfold. Charlie, you're so alone, and you're terrible at hiding. I heard the familiar voice on the phone, and only then did I truly wake up. A horrific sense of dread pierced through me. I immediately grabbed my jacket and dashed to the station. There was no time to waste. I needed to finally find out who had been calling me at night. The office was quiet. The night watchman greeted me with a silent handshake and handed me the keys. The night patrol team was out. The dark corridor was unusually quiet. I sat at the computer to look up the tracing program for calls and addresses. Admittedly, I wasn't well versed in this, but I was determined not to leave until I found this hide-and-seek lover. At the time, I didn't realize he was much closer than it seemed. About an hour passed. 
I kept entering data, but the same message appeared on the screen. Invalid data. Please try again. It was nearly five in the morning, and I decided to wait for Burton to help trace the phone call. I only realized someone was standing next to me too late, and was completely vulnerable at that moment. Hello, Charlie. I had to come looking for you again. But I found you. I heard from behind me. When I turned around, I saw Martin. He had been working as a courier at our station for about a year. I rarely interacted with him and didn't really have the time. I'd never seen him socialize with colleagues or asked about his life. The station was a busy place, and I was still too new and bogged down with work. I hesitantly stood up from the desk, and that's when I saw something shining in Martin's hand. Buddy, you're not planning to... I couldn't finish my sentence before he swung his arm through the air. What happened next felt like it was in slow motion. Mason and Stan burst into the office, followed by the guard. They tackled Martin and took him out of the room, leaving me alone with my thoughts. Later, I learned that Mason had been suspicious of this odd fellow for a while. He noticed Martin watching colleagues and taking notes. One day, he even ambushed our secretary and scared her badly. The note on my desk was indeed placed by him, and Mason had caught Martin at Burton's workstation, presumably when he deleted the camera footage. We never found out what he intended to do, but I'm certain my colleagues saved my life. I don't know much about his fate afterward. Mason mentioned he definitely needed psychiatric intervention, and eventually the story faded. I've since moved and am working in a different city. Dorothy moved with me. We're raising two children and it seems are happy. Life is full of surprises, but sometimes it's dangerously so. Fourth story. Help! He won't let us out! This horrific scream still echoes in my mind and the memories of that day pierce right through me. My name is Ben and I've been working in law enforcement for 10 years. I could tell thousands of horrifying stories and suggest that children be kept away from the screen. But right now, I want this story to be heard not just by parents, but also by their kids. Never take life for granted. Sometimes it throws a cruel boomerang back at you. It seemed to be my fifth year on the job. As an experienced cop who had proven his worth, I was assigned a young partner. That's the way it is. Whether we like it or not, no one asks us. Seniors always teach the juniors, often by their own example. Phil was a very young guy, funny and shy. How he ended up in the force, only God knows. Apparently his dad pulled some strings, not caring about his son's interests. Our relationship could hardly be called perfect. My friend and partner Bob had been injured and had to leave the service. I missed him and didn't want to train some newbie. But Phil showed remarkable patience and managed to earn my respect. He silently endured my quirks and only asked questions that mattered. Soon we began to communicate better and better. In the field, the kid also turned out to be quite adept, although he never hid his reluctance to work at the station. That night, we were on duty together. The shift was too quiet, and I already knew what that usually meant. Police and doctors always have their superstitions. In the middle of the night, we received a call. Two girls needed help in a suburban house. Home invasion, the operator concluded dryly and hung up. Phil took the wheel and sped up. We raced through the night streets, and in my head, I was already formulating a plan to rescue the young girls. If it was a burglar, that was fine. They usually take valuables and leave. But if it was some psychopath, within 10 minutes, we were there. The small, light-colored house was at the very end of a deserted street. From the outside, it looked like a dollhouse. A well-kept garden was adorned with flower pots, and bright lights, carefully strung along the terrace by skilled hands, completed the fairy tale look. But that's where the fairy tale ended. Because my gaze immediately fell on the red stains all over the front door, and my gut told me it wasn't berry jam. We approached the entrance slowly. Phil signaled to me that he was going to circle around the property. Hardly had he left when a wild scream erupted. Help! 
He's keeping us! And my worst fears were confirmed. The person behind the door wanted more than just valuable items. In such cases, swift and coordinated action is necessary. This is Officer Dorton. You are surrounded. Put down whatever you're holding and come out with your hands up. I followed the protocol, but inside, everything was tearing apart. I had already handled quite a few tragic cases in my career and knew how it might end. It went silent behind the door. Phil wanted to run to the car to call for backup, but I couldn't let him do that. I didn't know if the person behind the door had seen us and how dangerous he was. Just then, another scream, utterly heart-wrenching, tore through the silence. I immediately slammed into the door, which literally flew off its hinges. Phil rushed forward without waiting for my command. At that moment, I experienced a wild fear for my partner. Such rookie mistakes can be fatal. It was quiet in the dark living room. I immediately noticed red stains on the floor. It seemed something had been dragged across the hallway. Damn, that's when I realized we should have called for backup. Ben, get over here fast! I heard Phil's voice filled with genuine horror. I rushed to the call and found myself in a small children's room. Posters of popular artists from that era adorned the walls. In the corner, an old tape recorder was playing some pop music. It was clearly a teenage girl's room. I felt a knot in my stomach. But when I looked at the bed, there they were, both sitting and barely holding back laughter. The two girls, smeared with paint, clutched their stomachs and looked at us with innocent eyes. Sorry, officer sir, we lost a bet. I heard, and in my anger I was ready to tear down all the posters from the walls. Phil looked at me, bewildered and silent. Well, the outcome was quite mundane. The parents paid a fine, and it seems the father had a serious talk with his daughters. But the universe had a crueler lesson in store. After that incident, Phil resigned. He refused to work in a place where any teenager could summon him instead of a clown. I wasn't surprised. Youthful idealism plus a lack of love for the job. It's all quite simple and overall. I was glad that the guy could go his own way. As for me, I had to encounter this family again in my life. But this time, the story turned out to be much more terrifying. I'm not at liberty to disclose the details of that case. I can say one thing. These people had to face a real criminal. And fortunately, everyone survived. Every action has consequences, and sometimes they can be quite severe. Fifth story. The Intercept Plan. This was what I had always feared. No one could ever predict the outcome. And not everyone came back from such operations. If you think working in law enforcement is like an action movie, you are sorely mistaken. In reality, there's no room for romance or heroic posturing. There are real criminals and those who stand to protect the citizens. When it happened, I was still quite young. We didn't know what modern gadgets and computer technology were back then. All we had were issued handguns under signature and old crackling radios. I'll be honest, during my years of service, a lot has happened. There are things I'm scared to remember. Friends urge me to create a page and share memories of my service with readers. Maybe I'll take their advice. But today, I want to talk about an incident that first introduced me to real danger. And it was then that I understood how fragile life could be. It was my first serious operation to neutralize serious criminals. What they had done is still incomprehensible to me. There might be children watching today, so I can't disclose all the details. But rest assured, these are the types of people you see in Crime Chronicles. Was I scared? Very. I was a very young guy and wasn't eager to play the hero. Experience comes with time. Now I would rush into a blazing hell without a second thought, but back then, I just wanted a peaceful life. That night was simply nightmarish. There were about ten of us. Reinforcements were sent too late, and all our efforts were focused on capturing five criminals scurrying through the forest looking for an escape. Greg, move to Grid 5 with Jack and Simon. 
Hold position and keep quiet. The radio crackled and every sound made my heart clench. We wandered through the dark thicket, afraid to make a wrong step. Simon led the way. Jack kept disappearing from sight, which irritated me immensely. I brought up the rear and covered the group, but he clearly wasn't following the protocol. We took our positions. Simon was called to another group. I tugged at Jack's sleeve and demanded he keep quiet. My partner just smirked and then suddenly darted off in an unknown direction. A minute later, his back disappeared into the thick undergrowth. I was furious. Jack's recklessness was infuriating. He seemed to play with danger and didn't care about his own life. Every shift for him became a game. He's going to get himself killed, I thought, not knowing it would happen so soon. The moon was bright in the sky. The forest was so quiet I could hear my heart beating. I stood in position, listening intently to the thicket, afraid to miss the slightest rustle. Suddenly, a sound of a breaking stick came from nearby. I jerked in that direction and drew my weapon. The radio was traitorously silent. I tried to signal the group, but only heard interference. Moving towards the source, I felt sweat trickle down my forehead. I hesitated for just a second, but when I looked up, I saw him. A few meters away stood a guy. He was silently looking away and smiling strangely. And only then did I see he was in police uniform. Phew, buddy, you really scared me, I smiled. Which grid are you from? Yeah, it's restless around here tonight, the stranger quietly replied and extended his hand. He gripped my hand firmly, and at that moment I realized something was off. You know, I've always been attentive to details. It's an indispensable skill for law enforcement officers. Faces, phone numbers, distinguishing features, nothing ever escaped my notice. And right then, I saw something I definitely should not have seen. My colleague's hand bore a barely noticeable tattoo, a set of five dots. I already knew what it meant. Such tattoos aren't made in ordinary shops, and they mean much more than they appear. The guy noticed my intense gaze because he quickly pulled away his hand and lowered his sleeve. What's your name? I asked, trying to keep calm. Tim, he replied reluctantly and began looking nervously around. Just a second later, my radio crackled with calls. Attention all squads, we have a casualty. Can you hear me? This is Jack. Be careful, someone stripped him. The criminals might be wearing uniforms. I immediately rushed at Tim and subdued him with a few moves. The fear seemed to evaporate in that moment. It returned much later when I began to comprehend what had happened and what this man could have done to me. Fortunately, everything ended well. The gang was neutralized. A couple of criminals continued to run in the forest for several more days, but were caught at the border. Jack recovered quickly and returned to service a few months later. His defiance was gone. Life had taught him caution. Sick story! I hate clowns! If you think that eerie circus stories only happen in movies, you are very much mistaken. You can't even imagine how many crimes occurred during festivities and masquerades. As a child, my father took me to a vibrant circus show. I ran out of there in tears. The wild clowns in their ridiculous outfits and terrifying smiles were horrifying. One of them pressed so close to me that I couldn't even move, while my father stood by laughing, not thinking to help. Shall we play, dear child? I remember that phrase and still wake up in cold sweat from the terrifying dreams. All that is in the past. Today, I am a grown man working in the police force. There are too many terrifying things in life, and I've experienced plenty of them firsthand. But one day, I found myself back at a circus and certainly not by choice. It was a long time ago, but I remember every small detail, no matter how much I try to forget. Teenager missing. One of the most frequent calls in our service. Youthful idealism and a desire for independence sometimes lead to dire consequences. We deploy all our resources to find the young ones and pray for a successful outcome. 
Our town was restless those years. It seemed people had gone mad. I had never seen so many crimes in my lifetime. Come to the most colorful show. Amazing acrobat tricks, rides, magicians, and the most unique characters. All this awaits you at our circus park. Hurry, the tour is ending soon. The radio ad was annoying. I already knew what would happen. The number of accidents at such events was off the charts. Desperate parents flooded our station's phones. Children ran from their hands, scampering across the area, while their mothers, seized by hysteria, clung to the sleeves of security guards. Once, we had to rescue several people from an extreme ride. Exhausted rescuers did their job. We processed paperwork and prepared fines. Owners of private establishments seldom thought about safety measures. And rest assured, even after shelling out money, they were in no hurry to make improvements. Smuggling illegal animal transport. And this is all about circuses. I was driving to another call in the service car, feeling very nervous. Maybe I should have seen a psychologist long ago, but I preferred to deal with these emotions on my own. A team was already on duty at the entrance. I caught a familiar face and approached my colleague. What do we have today? I tried to remain calm. Fifteen years old, she went to a performance in the morning. Parents are in a panic. Friends say they've gone home long ago. In such cases, we act cohesively. Territory patrol, witness statements, management consultations and searches. We could only dream about modern surveillance cameras back then. It's hard to imagine now how we managed without today's gadgets. It was getting dark. I wandered around the area and carefully inspected the premises. Laugh room. A bright sign glowed in acidic tones, forcing one to squint. Well, I hope we'll have a laugh today, I thought, and walked inside. To my surprise, it was empty. Apparently, people had had their fill since the morning. There was about an hour left until the attractions closed. The room was quite gloomy. Only the lighting on the absurd mirrors guided the way. I cautiously stepped along the narrow aisles and looked into the reflections. My body floated and took on bizarre forms. It was supposed to provoke laughter, but I never understood what so fascinated the visitors. I didn't even notice how he appeared behind me. A shadow flickered suddenly, and what I saw caused me a wild fright. I don't know how to describe this person. Short stature, some strange face. It seemed as if someone had molded it from wax with an unskilled hand. The man tilted his head and watched every move I made with interest. Sparse gray hair fell over his forehead and his hands. I'd never seen such long hands before. I instinctively reached for my gun but immediately checked myself. I needed to act calmly and cautiously. Sir, I need your help, I started and slowly turned around. The man jerked and pressed himself against the mirror. It seemed he was afraid I might attack him, but his penetrating eyes continued to drill into me. Damn, I don't know how to explain it. They moved so fast, like lasers, and it was driving me crazy. I felt as vulnerable as if I had returned to my childhood. When that sneering clown towered over me, as if he was the master of the universe, and I was just a speck of dust, with a tremor in my voice, I asked again, Have you seen a girl here? Shoulder-length blonde hair, wearing a denim jacket with Mickey Mouse embroidered on the back? The man suddenly straightened up, and a wild smile lit up his face. In a fraction of a second, he was very close, leaning his head against my shoulder. I smelled an unpleasant sour scent and recoiled. Then he reached out his hand and pointed to a barely noticeable passage. I tried to keep control. Without taking my eyes off him, I moved forward and hesitantly opened the doors. However, I no longer seemed to be of any interest to this strange man. He casually took out a rag and started wiping the mirrors. Behind the door was a small courtyard. A girl was sitting on a bench. She held a player, the music playing so loudly that it was audible through the headphones. Light long hair, a denim jacket, it was her, nonchalantly playing with a puppy and smiling. I later found out that this man was a circus employee from a troop of people with special needs. 
the girl got a scolding from her parents and a lecture from the officers who had exhausted themselves searching every inch of the park. And I will never forget how my childhood nightmare came back to haunt me. It took many years before I could calm down and undergo psychological therapy. But if you ask me now what I dislike in my life, I'll tell you, it's the circus. Seventh story. Damn, never tell me ghosts don't exist. I've seen one as clearly as any of you. And believe me, it's terrifying. Have you ever found yourself in bad places? No, I'm not talking about tough jobs or homes with bad vibes. You know, there are settlements with a bad reputation. Normal people try not to linger there, but there are those who have nowhere else to go. My past was pretty grim. After serving time for theft, I was released to find myself unwanted by anyone. I spent my childhood in an orphanage, never made any friends during my school years. Maybe it was my difficult character, or maybe I just understood people too well. I always saw more in a person than they wanted to show. And if you think you're surrounded only by kind-hearted friends with good intentions, I'd bet a hundred bucks you're wrong. Sorry if I offended anyone, but people always look for their own benefit, even in relationships with close ones. I could only afford to rent an old room, and finding a job was a serious problem. Like I said, with my background, I wasn't in high demand. I don't remember where I saw the ad, maybe in some old newspaper. A nearby state's industrial base needed night guards. The promised pay was enough for a decent living, and I was ready to move. The company provided housing and meals. The remote town lacked almost any amenities, but that didn't scare me. I immediately called the number listed and arranged a meeting. That same day, I boarded a dusty bus and headed for a new life. Well, it indeed became a new one. If only I had known how. Mr. Dartons, there's one thing, said a sweet girl conducting the interview in a soft voice. Here we go, I thought, assuming I was unwanted here too. I laid it all out for her, about my life, education, and sentence. But as she continued, my eyes widened more and more. Just imagine. This young lady with a serious face told me that we were in a cursed place. There used to be an old cemetery here, which they paved over with asphalt. I hardly listened further. I only caught that wild things could happen at night on the base, but I should under no circumstances go outside. In case of danger, there was a panic button to call for backup. Anders, I'm serious. Stop smiling. She finished her story at last. I received a pass and keys to my future dwelling. On my way out, I heard again about checking locked doors and not going outside after midnight, but I just waved it off. I won't bore you with details about moving into my five-star hotel and processing the paperwork. The room had a fridge, a sink, and a bed. And that was good enough. An elderly, gray-haired man handed over the shift to me. He was quite reticent, which I appreciated. I don't like idle chatter. After touring the fairly large facility, Thornton handed me the key, shook my hand, and walked out into the street. The first day went quite smoothly. I made several rounds, dug into books and crosswords left by my partner, drank about five cups of strong coffee, and even dozed off. Well, with these conditions, I could work, but I didn't yet know what was ahead. The day off flew by more unnoticed than I thought. That evening, Thornton was grimmer than a cloud. I asked if he was all right, but he just waved his hand and said he was very tired tonight. Closer to midnight, I think I started to understand what had worn out my partner so much. Some inexplicable madness began outside. Through the murky windows above the ceiling, I could only see flashes of light. It seemed that some vagrants had gathered and were throwing a party. First, they laughed loudly. Among the voices, I could tell there were both men and women, but then their voices grew louder and turned into enraged screams. And here, guys, is where things got really interesting. By that point, I was already quite nervous. I paced around the warehouse and checked the doors. You know, at that moment, I didn't feel so brave anymore. And I definitely didn't plan to go outside with an old wooden bat in my hands. But it seems someone wanted to get inside, because suddenly there was a vague noise at several doors, and then they began to pound on them. 
The metal bases cracked and bent. It couldn't be just human strength. Each door was over 10 centimeters thick, but I thought they would break in half. And then I ran. I dashed to the emergency button, feeling a wild fear, and I prayed that the police car would arrive as fast as possible. I left the post and headed towards the entrance, feeling an inexplicable anxiety that drove me mad. I needed to maintain control no matter what. Sir, is anyone there? Do you need help? A pleasant, quiet voice called out from somewhere to the side, and I exhaled with relief. A young officer stood before me. He was holding an old radio, smiling amiably, and sizing me up from head to toe. Could you show your documents? We'll deal with the intruders shortly, he continued. I turned back towards the post, and at that very moment, a sharp thought pierced my mind. How the hell did he get in? The warehouse was completely isolated. I spun around quickly but saw no one. I ran past the tall shelves, but confirmed that no one else could be there but me and the rats. I can say one thing. I was ready to burst into tears like a girl, and when I heard a sharp knock on the metal, I almost fainted from terror. Sir, open up. It's the police. Thornton, is that you causing trouble today? I heard a mocking voice and approached the door. Through the small window with bars, I could see a patrol car. A police officer stood at the entrance holding up a badge so it could be seen. It was dark and quiet outside, as if nothing had happened. After my confused story, two officers just waved their hands, had me sign some document, and headed to the exit. One of them turned around, winked, and shrugged his hands in the air. This place is always full of devilry, kid. Get used to it. You were warned, he shouted, and walked out onto the street. That same evening, I was sitting on a bus that was taking me back. Fortunately, my room hadn't been rented out yet, and I had somewhere to return. I was paid quite decently for the days I worked. The sweet girl in the office, like the police officer, shrugged and muttered something about how she had warned me. My life, fortunately, got back on track. Everything was standard. Work, family, children, home. But there wasn't a day when I didn't remember that terrible night. Eighth story. It was a cruel joke. And if they had known what it would lead to for me, they probably wouldn't have done it. That year I was interning at an old police station. You know how they treat the newbies? They tease, play pranks, and send you to handle the most disgusting cases. A homeless fight? A call to a drunk couple's apartment? Rest assured. It's going to be you. However, my colleagues were quite nice. On weekends, we could meet up at the pub or play basketball. Johnny, you're the future terror of the neighborhood, Colin would laugh during one of the gatherings with colleagues. I was used to his silly jokes and had stopped paying attention. Colin had been faithfully serving for seven years and was well regarded by the management. He truly had a lot to teach and I dreamed of securing a position at this station. I liked the quiet, peaceful town I was assigned to, the colleagues, the cozy little apartment, and I must admit, I really liked the girl who worked at the shop across the street. It seemed mutual. Guys, how about we send him to our archives? He hasn't been there yet. Colin wouldn't stop. The company fell silent. Stop it, buddy. Hulk sharply cut him off. He was the oldest employee in our small office. What? Everyone's gone through this initiation, hasn't he? Isn't he one of us? Someone quickly changed the subject, but I couldn't forget about that story. And Hulk's reaction really bothered me. It seemed like something worried him. I knew about the new, convenient archive room. It had been opened a couple of years ago. Employees could access it at any time with special passes. But still, every shift we were greeted by Mrs. Sullivan. A pleasant and kind woman, she had been retired for many years. The guys told me she was the mother of one of the officers who tragically died during an arrest. The whole team knew her. She always came to her Sammy's basketball games and brought fresh pastries to the station. Working in the archives had become her real salvation, and she gave her boundless love to her colleagues. I had never seen anyone kinder than Mrs. Sullivan. 
but the talk was certainly not about the new, well-equipped room. One day I couldn't hold back and approached Colin. What's this initiation story about? I asked directly. Colleague laughed, then made a scary face and told me a strange story. In the basement was an abandoned archive. For a long time, it stored personal belongings of crime participants, evidence, and documents. The first mention of the mystique happening there came from an employee who got stuck during a night shift because of a broken lock. Green insisted he heard someone laughing there. Rumors spread across the station at the speed of light. And then, every second person began to claim they saw ghosts there or heard voices or footsteps. The archive badly needed repairs, and when plaster fell on someone's head, it was closed and disbanded. But the colleagues couldn't stop themselves and started sending newbies to the basement. They had to go through the initiation ritual, proving their bravery and readiness to face danger. Hey, wanna try? Come on! If you haven't spent the night in the archive, you're not a real man! Colin laughed, finishing the story. And you know what? I decided I was no worse than my colleagues and ready to prove my courage. That evening, I asked Colin to take me to the archive and not to tell Hulk. Honestly, I was embarrassed to engage in such follies before that wise man. We agreed that the guys would let me out in two hours. Those days, the bosses could show up at the station at any moment. The lock clicked and the heavy iron door slammed shut. Colin knocked from the other side and laughed. I was left completely alone. The dim light bulb barely glowed. Dusty shelves held someone's belongings. Old sneakers, a comb, a school notebook. It was eerie to look at them and imagine what had happened to their owners. The first hour passed quietly. I even got bored wandering between the narrow aisles in the dim light. But at one moment, I suddenly felt that I was not alone there. Guys, it's the creepiest feeling, let me tell you. I was looking around, trying to see anything. It felt like someone was walking next to me, barely touching my hand, hair, face. The light bulb flickered, and at that instant, I heard a wild roll of thunder. Through the narrow window near the ceiling, I saw the black sky and flashes of lightning. Unable to bear it, I ran to the door and started banging on it there was no one on the other side. You won't leave. You'll lose, I clearly heard right by my ear. I turned around and screamed. God, I was so scared then. There was no one next to me, but I knew I wasn't alone. I screamed so hard that I lost my voice. Finally, the doors opened and I saw a breathless Colin. The smile vanished from his face when he saw my condition. I silently got up, gulped down a glass of water, excused myself to the duty officer, citing feeling unwell, and went outside. The starry sky was so beautiful. The dry asphalt made it clear that there had been no storm. Could it be that I really heard ghosts, and that the tales about the archive were actual reality? Jumping into my old Ford, I turned the key and the car slowly started moving. Thoughts were swirling in my head. I hadn't caught the moment when a large dog appeared in the middle of the road. It darted out so quickly that I barely managed to hit the brakes. The dog gave me a knowing look and ran off. That night passed without sleep. I lay in bed trying to make sense of the phrase I had heard. You won't leave, you'll lose. And you know what? By early morning, I had decided to quit the force. It came to me so clearly along with the realization that there was no other way. It might sound crazy, but I don't ask to be judged. My colleagues didn't understand what had happened, and Colin was worried that it was because of the silly prank with the archive. I didn't tell anyone what I saw and heard, just joked that I was scared. I don't know how my life would have turned out if I had stayed at the station. But today, I am a successful company executive married with two children, and I want to believe that I made the right decision. Ninth story, ever been to abandoned towns? Believe me, it's a sight far scarier than any horror movie. 
In my life, there's been a wild story connected to travels in places where no human had stepped for ages. And it's exactly what led me to work for the most renowned search group in the county. We were all 18 years old. Who were we? A group of teenagers grabbing life for the adrenaline. My best friend Harry was obsessed with trips to the most remote areas of the world. Well-known magazines published his photos, which held deep meanings. If you want, in the next issue, I'll talk about an abandoned psychiatric clinic near the town of Beacon. Craig House is the creepiest place I've ever seen. But that was just a regular trip. Beautiful, scary, but calm. Back then, we had no idea how life would turn just a few weeks later. Glenn, get ready. We're heading to an interesting spot on the map in three days. Luke and Miller are already on board. Harry was unstoppable. I barely opened my eyes and glanced at the clock. It was just 7 a.m. when my friend burst into my life with his new idea. Well, I was always ready for new adventures, and a few days later I stood in the yard waiting for my friends. We stocked up on food and drinks, jumped into an old minibus and set off. The town was no different from dozens of others we had seen, but Harry had a clear plan. He couldn't afford to miss a single former settlement, especially if it was nearby. Want to immerse yourself in the atmosphere of forgotten places? Then I won't burden you with road trip memories. It was a standard trip with one stop at a roadside hotel. Imagine. You're standing on a hill and before you unfolds the view of an abandoned settlement. Life once thrived here. Can you hear the laughter of children? They're heading to school early in the morning. People are rushing to shops, to work, chatting among themselves. Cars drive down the road. Lights are on in houses. Someone is cooking lunch, watching TV, or talking on the phone. But now, time seems to have stopped. Some homes have broken windows. Vagrants have done their deed, and there's likely nothing valuable left inside. Curtains flutter in the wind. It feels like someone might peek out and see you. This thought breaks everything inside for a moment, and it gets eerily quiet. Dusty roads, rusty cars. The sun shines, and somewhere far away, you can hear the singing of birds. It's just you and the empty city. Believe me, it's captivating. We walked down a narrow street, chatting. Harry pulled out his camera, and Luke had just cracked open a can of beer. Ahead was a whole day in the forgotten town, and the spirit of freedom was nearly bursting out of our chests. In reality, we operated on a standard plan. The main rule was to not linger. You never know who you might meet on the way, and we always parked the car at the entrance so we could return to camp by nightfall if needed. The old school was nearly destroyed, and in several houses we found nothing interesting except a small photo album and a porcelain service. Guys, come over here! Miller was clearly inspired by something. We stepped out onto the highway and saw an abandoned police station ahead. Harry was already running towards new adventures. But suddenly, I was overcome with an inexplicable sense of dread. It was as if I already knew that we were about to encounter something unexplainable. The empty halls were silent and gloomy. The flashlight beam reflected off the gray walls with peeling paint. In dusty offices, heaps of papers lay scattered. The furniture was destroyed and there was wild disarray, a standard sight for forgotten places. It's clear someone lived here, Luke said, pointing to a corner. On the floor lay old mattresses and dirty blankets. Harry took a few photos. We explored the station thoroughly and decided it was time to leave. The sun was already setting and we hoped to get back to camp before dark. I was the last to leave when I heard some kind of howling from deep within the dark corridor. To be honest, I was really scared. The thought flashed through my mind that there might be some wild animal there. Miller was already outside, but he immediately turned around and rushed back inside. Guys, there's something there, he exclaimed excitedly as he re-entered. He was the most daring among us, and sometimes that really irritated me. Harry and Luke hesitantly followed him, while I just stood there, paralyzed by a growing sense of dread. We wandered the long corridors, 
trying to locate the source of the sound. Suddenly, a strange, muffled moan echoed through the building. Miller dashed into one of the rooms and screamed wildly. I don't know how to describe what happened next without you thinking it's all made up. It looked like some kind of holding cell. The empty room contained only an old table and a bench, and in the corner we saw a hatch with a metal cover. Needless to say, Miller was already trying to lift it, and what it concealed. A person was lying on the floor. He was dressed in torn and dirty clothes, his face down. The guy was moaning and seemed unable to move. Harry and Luke rushed to help, and within minutes we had the poor man out in the open. I'll never forget his face. It was a mask of extreme suffering. He didn't speak, just made strange noises and looked at us as if he'd never seen people before. Guys, you can't imagine how scared we were. Miller ran to get the car, Harry grabbed some kind of blanket, and we carried the man outside. All the way, he was silent and stared at us with wild eyes. I have no idea how long he had been alone or what had happened to him. We returned to town and immediately went to the police. We handed the guy over to the officers, provided detailed statements, and were allowed to go home. But you know what's the strangest part of this story? We were never bothered or asked to come to the station again. Miller made numerous calls, but he was assured everything was being handled, and they didn't need anything more from us as witnesses. I scoured the entire internet for any information. I searched through search sites, checked data on missing people and the area we were in. Nothing. Sometimes it feels like it was all a bad dream. Years have passed. I am happy that we could save someone's life. Harry continues to be passionate about his trips, but the rest of us have kind of given it up, settled down with families, and immersed ourselves in work. I consider myself a successful specialist. Helping people in the most difficult situations has become my life's motto. Our search team operates smoothly, and the number of successful rescue operations keeps growing. It seems I've found my calling. But this sense of uncertainty still haunts me. What really happened there? Do you love creepy real-life stories? Or maybe you've been part of something inexplicable? Subscribe to the channel, give a thumbs up, leave comments. The wildest horror is yet to come. A most welcome trip. Lindsay had been urging me to visit an abandoned North Carolina park for a long time. This trip could be my last. My name is Sally. My best friend and I have traveled halfway around the world. We're not exactly crazy about mystical places. Ever since I was a kid, I've been drawn to the oppressive atmosphere of forgotten territories where no man has ever set foot. Lindsay's father is a traveler. We went on our first camping trip when we were five years old. I remember the three of us sitting around the campfire. Uncle Sam was telling stories and we were laughing. The itinerary had been planned long ago. All we had to do was agree on a vacation. We postponed the trip twice. First Lindsay got sick, and then tragedy struck our family. My beloved grandmother passed away. In retrospect, it seems to me that these were signs of fate. We didn't figure them out. Now I'm more attentive to my premonitions. Load the backpack. Did you remember the water? Get the speaker from the trunk. My friend commanded me. The long-awaited day had arrived. The beautiful weather and bright sunshine made the journey even more exciting. It was just me, Lindsay, and the stunning view from the window of the old pickup truck. You're driving! I've already opened a cocktail! My friend laughed and jumped into the passenger seat. To be honest, I didn't like this car. It was big, creaky, and crazy old. I think Lindsay had gotten it from her grandfather. Sighing heavily, I got behind the wheel. It wasn't going to be a long drive. Dusk was falling. We drove along the deserted highway, singing our favorite songs. Do you remember the scary story about the pale boy? Oh. My friend suddenly asked, creased her face, and held out her hands. I have to say I'm a hardened skeptic. 
Maybe it was the endless nights and tents in the thickest forest thickets that reflected this. I don't believe in otherworldly forces. Ghost stories certainly don't scare me. I just smiled. The only thing I wanted to do now was rest. We've been on the road for hours. Look on the map. How long will it take us to get to the nearest cafeteria? I asked Lindsay. And My friend took out a map and started checking the terrain. The connection on the phones was treacherously failing. Suddenly there was a thick smoke from under the hood. The car shook and lost speed. Damn it! That's just what I needed! I blurted out in frustration. Lindsay, how long have you been to the service station? I didn't want to linger on the empty highway. Only two cars had passed us during the three hours we'd been traveling. We got on the road. Lindsay opened the hood. You'd think she'd know her way around a car. The phones showed empty antennas. We had to wait for a miracle, namely some random hitchhikers. Help came faster than we thought. Half an hour later, headlights blinked ahead. Lindsay jumped out into the roadway and waved her arms. A police car pulled up in front of us. An elderly officer got out slowly. God, we were so happy to see him. Good evening, girls. Good evening, what's up? Do you need any help? My name's Barry. The man smiled and showed his badge. We explained the problem in a confused manner. Barry looked under the hood, tweaked something and shook his head no. It's a mess. We've got to pull it. I can help. There's a good friend's house nearby. He's a mechanic from God. But now he's away. But I have the keys to the garage. We'll figure something out. We looked at each other and immediately agreed. The cop was polite and didn't seem suspicious. Where are you headed? Lindsay told us what we were doing. Barry laughed and nodded. My daughter went there with some friends. It really is a gorgeous place. Then let's not waste any time. Get in the car. Barry deftly picked up the pickup truck and slowly pulled us into the distance. It was only a few minutes later when he pulled up in front of an old house. We stepped outside. Tea. Coffee. Or maybe something stronger laughed our savior. Come inside. The door is heavy. Pull it hard. Find something to eat and rest. I'll fix your faithful friend. We went into the gloomy room. There was a dim light in the kitchen. There was a stack of newspapers on the table and an unfinished glass of slop. Sally, I don't feel right. Why don't we leave? Lindsay clung to my arm. Yeah, this place is creepy. Why don't we wait in the car? We turned to leave when we heard the key jangling. I tried the door, but it wouldn't open. The lights went out. Sit down, birds. Be good girls. We heard Barry's voice. Open it! Lindsay yelled. I ran inside the house. I had to find a way out. All the windows were boarded up. Lindsay was howling in the hallway. She tried in vain to dial 911. I couldn't get a signal. I went into another dark room. I had to get my head together. We can do this. I sat down on the bed and immediately jumped up. There was something under the comforter that looked like a person, but it didn't move. Suddenly we heard the sound of an engine. It was Barry's car. He'd gone somewhere. We had to find a way out. Lindsay was screaming and crying. I ran up to her and slapped her face with the palm of my hand. Pull yourself together. We have to find a way out. We've been running from room to room. Not a single loophole. I swore to myself that this was the last journey. I was willing to sacrifice everything to get home. Sally, this way, there's a hatch, Lindsay shouted. We went down and found ourselves in a dark basement. It was completely empty. The whole floor was stained with some kind of red liquid. We saw a small window in the wall. I pulled Lindsay up and she was able to squeeze out the glass. It was very difficult to fit through the narrow opening without hitting the shards. We made it outside and fell to the ground exhausted. I was crying from breathing and seeing the beautiful starry sky. It seemed like we had been running forever. 
When we got to the gas station, we immediately called the emergency services. It's been a year. They never found him. The police gave us a report. They found nothing suspicious during the search. All our testimony was useless. The case was dismissed for lack of evidence. The car was returned to us. Our belongings weren't in it. All this time we were afraid to even leave the house. This man is still at large. The other day, I got an email from a closed account. Hi beautiful, you are very rude guests. India is beautiful. That's what I thought until recently. It was my last trip. The mysterious world beckoned me with vivid colors. Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm a traveler. I don't like company. I hitchhike around the world and take pictures of the sights. Or rather, I've traveled... It wasn't the first time I'd been to a small town. The colorful area beckoned me with its identity. I took a whole series of pictures and was already planning to go back. All that was left was to go to the market and buy a couple of souvenirs for my colleagues. It was an amazing sunny day. The street was crowded as always. I was standing at a souvenir shop. Suddenly, two people approached me. They took out some documents and started to explain something. I couldn't understand what they were saying. I looked helplessly at the vendor, but he turned away and disappeared from sight. The men made me realize that I had to get in the car with them. I realized from their faces that I had better not argue. It was so wild that I silently got into the dark interior and the heavy door slammed in my face. How's that for a story? Can you imagine yourself in my shoes? I don't wish such a fate on anyone. My whole life was flashing before my eyes. I looked at the local streets and was afraid to say a word. In a daze, I looked at the passers-by. They were going about their usual business. Another day, and I could be home. The car stopped abruptly. One of the men led me out into the street. I saw a building that looked like a police station. It seemed abandoned. There were no people or cars around. I was escorted into an empty hall. In broken language, I tried to explain that it was a mistake and that I was just a tourist. It was as if no one heard me. I was led into a cage. A heavy deadbolt clicked behind me. I watched in silence as one of the officers went through my things. He picked up a cell phone and pulled out the SIM card. The last of the cash was in his pocket. The men chatted quietly and glanced at me. Then they left, remembering to turn out the lights. I cried like a baby, in the darkness and the unknown. Why do they want me? What do they want? I have no money and no connections. The most horrible images flashed through my mind. I was saying goodbye to my life. I don't know how much time had passed. It seemed like an eternity. Only the moonlight from the small window illuminated the abandoned lot. Suddenly I heard the sound of footsteps and whistling. Someone was approaching. I pressed myself against the wall and squeezed my eyes shut. The footsteps became clearer and closer. I opened my eyes and saw a human silhouette. It was especially creepy in the moonlight. It was a policeman, only his uniform was strange. They hadn't worn them in a long time. The man slowly approached the camera. I was numb with fear. His eyes. I'll never forget them. They could not belong to a human being. The mystical gaze sent shivers through my entire body. He jerked his hand sharply, and I saw the key. The door opened. A gesture showed me the way out. My legs wouldn't listen. I tried to get up and fell back down again. You think it's funny? Believe me, I'd like to laugh, but that day I turned completely gray. My third attempt to get up was futile. My legs were stiff. I hadn't eaten since last night. My lips were chapped from thirst. Before I knew it, he was there. Some force seemed to lift me to my feet, and I stepped out of the cell and collapsed to the floor with no energy. Idai! I swear to God, I heard that whisper. And I'll never forget it. I ran, fell down and got up again. I don't remember how I got to the center of town. Sweat dripped from my forehead. I was alive. And that's the most important thing. 
I made it home. No money, no pictures, no cell phone. I don't want to remember those hard days. The important thing is that I was alive. Of course, I tried to find any information I could about this creepy place. What I found made me believe in otherworldly forces. This precinct didn't exist. It had been disbanded over 100 years ago. The building was torn down. There should be a park on this site. But these people were real. Not only I saw them, but the merchant saw them. I'd give anything to know what happened that day. Someday, I will solve this mystery, no matter what it takes. It's not much longer. Just a little more, and I'll be out of these woods. Whatever it takes. Oh God, no! He's coming for me! Help me! I'm Kara. Today was my last session with the counselor. Mrs. Tracy encouraged me to share my story, so I could relive a traumatic experience and turn over a new leaf. Well, I'll give it a shot. Maybe it'll really help with the nightmares. It happened last spring. I was finishing a book. It was about to be published. I could be a famous author, and I could host literary soirees and book signings. I can't remember the last time I held a pen. This year has been hell for me. I was already finishing the ending when I realized I couldn't finish a chapter. The script was messing up and the plot wasn't connecting. I had to find inspiration. I had a special place for that. My country cabin in a neighboring state. It's a long drive, but it was worth it. My grandmother gave it to me. With the first royalties from the book, I'd made a huge renovation. This house was now an introvert's paradise. I hurriedly packed the necessary things, threw my laptop in the car, and hit the road. Inspiration came as soon as I pulled onto the deserted highway. The forest surrounded me on both sides. The trees flashed, reflecting in the fogged windows. The radio played pleasant music. I already knew how I was going to finish my story. Suddenly a woman jumped out onto the road. God, where did she come from in the middle of nowhere? I barely slowed down in time. The stranger slowly walked to the hood and collapsed to the ground. This was the last thing I needed. I ran out to her and tried to bring her to her senses. The lady opened her eyes. I went back to the car to get my cell phone to call for help. Shit, I couldn't get a signal. I forgot I'd driven into the suburbs. Ma'am, can you hear me? What's wrong? I tried to be calm. After all, I had a license plate recorder. I didn't hit anyone. If she's crazy, I'll have proof. Thank you, the woman whispered quietly. I feel better now. I'm lost. That's a good start, I thought. Do you need help? No, thank you. I'll try to find my way. Would you be able to leave? Neither could I. So I suggested she get in the car and try to make sense of the area. My name is Kate. The woman introduced herself and got into the passenger seat. She gave us a rough directions and we slowly drove off. Kate seemed nice. She told us that she had been living alone in a spacious cabin in the woods for a long time. Her son works in the city and rarely comes to visit. She misses him and waits. There is little or no phone reception in the area. Today she decided to climb to higher ground to call her Charlie. She hiked the forest trails in late summer, things changed during the season, and she got lost. It was literally 15 minutes later when my traveling companion perked up. Here. Here's my turn. Just a couple more meters and I'll be home. I remembered. I parked the car and breathed a sigh of relief. Now we can continue on our way. This is a story I'll add to one of my short stories. Kate thanked me for my participation and got out of the car. I was already turning around when I saw in the mirror that she had fallen exhaustedly into a snowdrift. Damn you! I thought in my heart and hit the brake. I'm sorry, Kara. My blood pressure must be racing. The old lady whispered quietly. I helped her to her feet. How could you leave an elderly person in such a state? I'll walk you out, missus. Show me the way. She clung to my arm and we slowly made our way down the forest path. Have you ever imagined a magic cabin in the woods? 
If you have, you'd think I'd seen it for real. It was a beautifully maintained house, with carved patterns and a stunningly beautiful veranda. There was a wooden swing in the yard. In a small box sat a beautiful snow-white dog. He barked joyfully when he saw his mistress. God, what beauty, I whispered. How do you live here alone? Aren't you scared? Kate smiled and invited me inside. I won't let you go until you've had my specialty hot chocolate. I couldn't say no to this strange but funny lady. This is a writer's dream come true. We walked into the cozy kitchen. It was bright and spacious. I sat down in a soft armchair and felt pleasantly tired. Kate was manning the table, and soon she brought me a hot drink. That's all I remember about that day. When I opened my eyes, it was dark. I tried to get up, but I was horrified to find that my hands and feet were bound. I couldn't open my mouth either. It was taped shut. My scream caught in my throat, and tears rolled from my eyes. I was terrified. Come to your senses, sweetheart. You're back to normal. I was getting bored. I heard a familiar voice. My eyes adjusted to the darkness. In the corner of the room I saw Kate's silhouette. She was rocking in a rocking chair. Squeak, 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 was a sound I would remember for the rest of my life. I'm so bored, Kara. Can we play? Kate slowly stood up and walked over to me. Something glittered in her hands. I squeezed my eyes shut, as suddenly there was a terrible knock on the door. The woman cursed and went to see who was there. I tried to untie my hands, but I hardly succeeded. There were sounds of struggling and stomping. A light came on in the room. God, it was a policeman. How did he find me? Ma'am, are you okay? You need help? The man rushed over to me and helped me untie the tight ropes. I looked back at Kate. She was standing in the corner, palms pressed to her face, whispering something. Can you go? Come with me. We're going to the station, and you're going to testify. He threw a warm blanket over my shoulders and helped me out of the house. And her? I was surprised. Don't worry, she's not going anywhere. Kate's mentally ill. We didn't have any evidence. But this time, we installed cameras. They recorded everything that happened. I can't give you the details. They'll explain everything at the station. I got into a police car. The officer put on his flashing lights, and we started up. My name is Jack Warrens. My name is Jack Warrens. Are you cold? Cold? I was terrified and I just prayed to God that it would be over. I didn't realize we'd pass my car. I'd left all my personal belongings and papers in it. Jack turned on the radio. We drove in silence for a while. Kara, how are you feeling? Where were you going? I started my story and then I stopped. How do you know my name? I didn't tell you my name. In the mirror, the policeman's wild eyes looked back at me. He sharply changed speed, and only now I realized we were going in the other direction. I screamed and tried to open the doors, but what could I do? There were bars separating us. All the exits were blocked. Calm down, Jack shouted at me. You know I wanted to play, but you ruined it, and you better shut up. The man gave me a look that made me realize he wasn't kidding. The car made a sharp turn. I couldn't see where we were going. For a second I thought I saw lights in the distance. We didn't drive long. The policeman hit the brakes and we stopped at a house I knew. Mommy misses you, Kara, and I don't like it when she's sad. I turned to the window in horror and saw Kate. She was standing on the porch by the open door. She had an axe in her hands. I screamed and struggled and prayed and I tried my best to stay in the car. And then it was all a blur. The roar of the engine, the men's screams, and the sounds of a struggle. I felt a bump, and then darkness fell. I woke up in the hospital. 
there was a nurse standing next to me. I had a concussion and a couple of abrasions. She told me I'd been found on the road outside the hospital, and so began a new chapter. Only this one belonged to my real new life. I called the police. They found Kate's cabin. She was brought in for questioning and then a medical examination. The woman was found to be profoundly demented with a host of related disorders, and she never had a son. Jack was never found. That employee wasn't in the system. No car, no footprints, nothing. I just had to live in fear and look out for any rustle. I'm trying, and I pray he never finds me. I walked into the room as he was trying to give her an injection. Could I have stopped him? Honey, I'm sick. Can you come over? Came Grandma's voice through the phone. I'm Taylor. I'm 18. Not long ago, I dreamed of being a cop and catching dangerous criminals. I'm an orphan. All I have left is my grandmother. She lives 30 kilometers away from our town. She's the only person I have in my family. I come to her on all vacations and holidays. Lately, Grandma has become worried about something. I was worried, and she wrote off everything on age and forbade me to break away from my studies. But this time, it was more serious than I thought. She literally couldn't speak. I grabbed my backpack, threw a few things in it, and hailed a cab. It was late afternoon. All the way there, I dialed my grandmother's number, but she didn't answer. I was scared. When the car stopped, it was already dark. I walked into the yard, opened the door quietly, and found myself in the dark hallway. The house was quiet. From the living room came the ticking of the clock. I decided to go quietly up to Ba's bedroom and make sure she was all right. I didn't want to frighten her with my imminent arrival. 87 years old is no joke. I walked quietly up the stairs and tried to be careful. The doors to the bedroom were ajar, and I walked toward them, stunned. The lantern light illuminated the room. The window was wide open. Standing at the headboard of the bed was some hooded man. He had his hand up and was about to do something. I screamed with wild fear, but it was enough. With a bolt of lightning, he sprang away. I ran up to my grandmother and began to shake her by the shoulders. She opened her eyes in bewilderment and I cried like a baby. What are you doing, Taylor? Jesus, what time is it? It's okay, I'm here. Get some rest. She turned on the light, sat down on the bed, and put on her glasses. Next to the nightstand, I saw a vial of something. I don't know why I didn't call the police. I was terrified and didn't know what to do next. My grandmother soon fell asleep and I stayed up all night. I was shaking pacing from corner to corner and begging for morning to come sooner. At breakfast, I tried to figure out what was going on in the house. Granny was strange. She didn't talk much and was always hovering, staring at one point. You know, I keep seeing the same face. It's a man. He has angry eyes and a huge scar on his cheek, she said thoughtfully. I jumped up in my chair. I should have kept my temper in check. What if he came back? No, I couldn't let it go. The ampule was in my backpack. I picked it up gently from the floor. Honey, what are you doing? Don't worry. An officer will be here in a moment and will talk. I resolutely dialed the number and asked the officer on duty to come. All I had to do was wait. It seemed like an eternity before I heard the call. Granny was dozing in her chair. I went to the door and opened it. There was a policeman standing on the doorstep. He hurriedly showed his badge, introduced himself, and wanted to come in. Suddenly I heard a frightened voice behind me. Taylor, it's him! Only now I saw a big scar on the officer's face. I shut the door before he could put his foot down. There was a loud bang. Grandma was crying, and I tried to comfort her. I was ready to cry myself. There was the sound of breaking glass from the kitchen. I grabbed the porcelain statue and ran. My phone was left on the second floor. I had to do something. The perpetrator was trying to climb in through the window. I don't know how it might have ended if it hadn't been for a passing farm truck. 
Help was quicker this time. The siren scared the officer. He took off. Investigators were able to determine that someone had indeed made an attempt on the grandmother's life. Motive? That remains to be seen. The precinct didn't get a call about my call. They needed an examination of the house phone. I gave the ampule to forensics. That same day, I moved Ba back to my place. Her health was badly compromised. I don't know what he wanted from us. I only know one thing. He's still at large. Would you like more horror stories? Give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We have something to surprise you.